I am Lauren Summers. I am Senior Director of Lifelong Learning and Travel at the Yale Alumni Association. And I organize this program, Yale Alumni Academy, along with my wonderful team of people behind the scenes. We are really pleased to welcome today Peter Swenson, who is C, uh, CM Sadden. Let me say it again. Peter Swenson, who is CM Sadden, Professor of Political Science at Yale. He earned his BA from Princeton and his PhD from Yale in 1985. So shout out to all the graduate class of 1985 students who are here. He is a two-time recipient of American Political Science Association's Mary Parker Follett Prize for Best Article in Politics and History. Most recently for the article, Misrepresented Interests, Organized Business, Medicare, and the Building of the American Healthcare State. He also received honorable mention for the association's Lubert Prize for Best Book in Comparative Politics for his book, Capitalist Against Markets, The Making of Labor Markets and Welfare States in the United States and Sweden. His latest book is from Yale University Press, was published just last year, and it's called Disorder, A History of Reform, Reaction, and Money in American Medicine. And we're really delighted to uh, invite you all to purchase signed copies of Professor Swenson's book from the Yale Bookstore. We have set aside a, um, uh, an allotment of copies just for participants in our Yale Alumni Academy program. So if you would like to order a copy of Professor Swenson's book, uh, there will be a link in the chat that will help you do that. And you can also look for this presentation on our Yale Alumni Academy web website. You'll find a link on that on the page dedicated to the presentation where you can find a copy of the book. And this presentation is being recorded. It will be available to watch on demand for anyone who missed it. And without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome you, Professor Swenson. Thank you so much for uh, being with us today. I know everybody is really excited to hear your presentation. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank, thank you, Lauren. Um, uh, I'm making sure, oh, I see, I have to click on continue. So uh, welcome every, everyone. Um, I'm broadcasting to you from uh, Squim, Washington on the beautiful Olympic Peninsula. Uh, I saw someone slipped by from Bellingham, which is fairly close. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I said, I'm in kind of phased retirement on the off ramp into retirement from uh, teaching over what 35 years um, and uh, part time teaching and trying to enjoy life fewer meetings, uh, fewer administ less administration and the like and so I have the good fortune of being able to get a change of scenery here out here. Um, as, as Lauren said I'm, I got my PhD from Yale in, in 1985. Um, uh, I met my wife, Lena Daly, in, in the Hall of Graduate Studies residential uh, dormitory for, for um, graduate students. Uh, and, and I had some great, um, just great experiences uh, as a, a stressed out graduate student. Um, I went on to teach at Penn and Northwestern for around 17 years before I came, was invited to come back to Yale um, in 2002. And um, I thought it might be interesting to mention some of the influences on my, me and my work from, from Yale. And I, I, I gather from the vintage of uh, a lot of you that you might well have had some of the same professors as I did if you took some political science courses, although I see a lot of you are from the medical field, but that doesn't mean you uh, didn't take a few political science courses. Um, uh, of particular importance were people in my uh, doctoral dissertation committee, Robert Dahl, who was a world famous um, expert and, and on, on democracy, uh, David Cameron, uh, Charles Lindblom, and um, th they were all my teachers and became my friends after when I returned to, to Yale. Um, James Scott, I should mention, I never took a course with him, but he was a 
big influence on me intellectually um, for my first uh, my doctoral dissertation and and my first book. So you might not have known um, some of those. Um, I, I'll go over to my screen now, share my screen just to give you some pictures. Uh, so some of you may recognize, I think that's what Dahl looked like when I, when I was a graduate student. Um, and, and, and one of his um, really um, uh, phenomenal books, um, Dem Democracy and Its Critics, and Charles Lindblom, uh, who uh, is famous for his book on politics and markets. And, and at, when I started teaching at Penn and Northwestern, I, I taught courses on democracy and its troubles. And um, also a course called Politics and Markets. So I, I had TA'd for Ed Lindblom's uh, uh, lecture course back, back then. Um, so uh, let me stop share for a second and say, um, so um, the, how and why would a political scientist turn to um, the history of medicine? And so my book is really a, a, a history, a medical history book. It's less political science than, than a history of the uh, medicine and medical politics. I, I'd like, I wanted to mention that I come from a medical family. Uh, my father was a professor pulmonary medicine at the University of Florida. Uh, my mother was a nurse. Um, she uh, went into public health nursing. Uh, I have a, uh, my, my brother Eric was, is a pulmonologist and critical spare, uh, care specialist at University of Washington. And his uh, son Kai, I proudly uh, now mention, um, went to Yale Medical School went on to um, Stanford, was elected chief resident by his uh, peers at Stanford. And now he's at uh, Harvard and Mass General Hospital doing also like his father, pulmonary and critical care medicine. Uh, I have another brother who's a pharmacist. So I'm, I'm the black, a black sheep in the family in some ways, as a younger sister too, who also did not go on into medicine. So um, I start out in political science studying uh, in, uh, um, influenced by uh, what I learned and was inspired by at Yale. Um, now here's a book by uh, Dahl and Lindblom uh, called Politics, Economics, and Welfare. And my recent book, Capitalists Against Markets, is in many ways something that uh, evolved out of my interest in uh, the economics and politics of the welfare state. And, and because of that also, I, I'm obviously social insurance of which healthcare insurance is, is a uh, really um, huge part of. Um, and, uh, and, but I, ultimately as a political scientist, I was mostly interested in health insurance and its costs and, distribution, but I'm not so much about um, what, what are we paying for? What's the quality of it? Why are we spending so much money uh, on, on healthcare and medicine uh, without thinking about, well, what are we getting for all this money? And as I was teaching a course, uh, Political Economy of Healthcare in, in uh, the various places I've taught, I came across this book which really had a powerful influence on me and I think set me in motion what I've been working on is a book by a um, medical journalist called Michael Millinson. I highly recommend it. Recommend it. Um, and he goes back into history, uh, among, among other things, bringing up the very fascinating figure in American medical history. It was a man named Ernest Amory Codman, uh, a surgeon. He was a famous surgeon. He was a, one of the co-founders of the American College of Surgeons. And he had this provocative, outrageous notion that um, we should measure the results of what we do as surgeons and physicians and report them and be held accountable for them and use the information uh, to improve. Um, well, that was not popular among um, his colleagues. And he ended up uh, in poverty, he was pretty much shunned and he was lost his um, position in, at the Mass 
his uh, position at Mass General Society. Another th so uh, to my book, um, which deals with um, a lot of historical, interesting historical figures, uh, um, a little bit on Codman. Um, it might interest you, a lot of you uh, no doubt are familiar somewhat with Paul Starr's famous book, The Social Transformation of American Medicine. I, um, I criticize Starr quite a bit in my book. Uh, I think he got a lot of things wrong, um, just starting in general with, he didn't talk about the politics of medicine. And as you, as we all know, there's, there's hardly anything in American society and politics that's more intensely polarizing and political than, than healthcare. So um, I think he also mis misconceived, misrepresented what um, medical power is, the power of the medical profession, where it comes from. Uh, wh why, why for most of the 20th century, the American Medical Association was so conservative, uh, even reactionary. So I'll be talking about, there's a lot, a lot of that in my book and I'll be talking somewhat about uh, 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 quite a bit in today, um, with time permitting, uh, about the conservatism of the American medical profession. I want to say at the outset here that um, mostly I'm a critic of organized medicine. Uh, I'm not critical of the medical profession as individuals per se. Um, there's a lot of faults. Um, a lot of the faults are, are systemic structural problems, uh, perverse incentives and, and um, constraints that uh, operate on an individual um, level. And that's where the reform has to happen is at the systemic level um, um, and it's where the structure of constraints and incentives uh, are, are changed. So a, a little scan of my uh, contents. A lot of my book is about what I call a, a progressive period in American medical politics up, to, up until the 1920s. I deal with um, the problems of drug reform, drug regulation, uh, public health. Um, and then uh, the uh, latter third or so of my book, I turn to what happened in the 1920s and, and, and then onward into the uh, late 20th century and even into our current century as a period of medical uh, conservative conservatism um, at, at an extreme level of conservatism, um, which has changed somewhat. So I wanna be fair, um, the American Medical Association is less of a conservative force than it once was. And so I can talk a little bit about what's happened um, and since the 1990s. So I think the changes, um, the, the kind of return to a partial medical progressivism um, started around the 1990s. So um, I call uh, the, the title of my talk is the American Medical Disorder. Uh, it, so there is one in my view, but I, not everyone agrees. Um, here, you, this quote is, um, might um, resonate with a lot of what you uh, have heard. Um, um, maybe some of, some of you have this view. Um, I, I disagree. Um, you, you might recognize the illustrious author of that, that opinion, a famous uh, Yale graduate. I'm not an expert in medicine uh, or the American healthcare system. Uh, and these are the kinds of things that he, but you know, to, to be fair, it's a kind of thing that you often hear. Uh, and, and um, it, you know, we don't all, we don't have the facts, especially comparative facts. What does the American system look like uh, relative to other countries in terms of its um, uh, uh, performance? And that's what I want to Look at here. So um, I just uh, I'm going to come back to this. But when you talk about emergency room care, um, I don't think many of you would want to go to the emergency room for treatment of. Uh, this is a large list of um, conditions, diseases that can be treated and um, death can be averted by timely quality uh, treatment. And you're just not going to get that in an emergency room. And I'm going to come back to that. Some research about. Uh, medically avoidable deaths. Um, so uh, Bush's opinion is not that of um, a lot of people, especially inside the medical profession. And one of, one of these is a, a very prominent um, 
cardiologist, Otis Brawley, um, who wrote a book saying he just, it just makes, infuriates him to hear that kind of thing. And um, we don't use our drugs and technologies appropriately. We maximize revenues instead of quality and value. We often harm patients. Uh, we ought to practice medicine rationally. We might save a lot of money and we could use that money we save for uh, covering other people and uh, doing better things. Now, um, I, I don't know you possibly know this, some of you, a lot of you, but we spend uh, almost twice as much as most other advanced industrial capitalist economies, capitalist democracies, um, and, and what are we getting for all that? Um, well, we're still not, with all that money we're spending, we're still not covering everyone. Um, and a lot of people, you know, 10% of the population is a very large number of people are still priced out um, because we passed Obamacare, Affordable Care Act in 2010. It, it included a, a compulsory expansion of Medicaid, um, but the Supreme Court overturned that portion of the uh, Affordable Care Act and there are a number of states um, not surprisingly, Republican dominated and mostly Southern states have re refused to uh, expand Medicare. So we, we spend a lot more money and we cover significantly fewer people. Um, we, uh, uh, the, most of what we spend money on in healthcare is um, in the commercialized sector. Even Medicare and Medicaid spending uh, relies large, uh, to a great extent on um, the commercialized portions of the healthcare system in a comparison to other countries. So although private expense, uh, public expenditure, uh, I mean, that in, in this sense, if you look over on the right, um, the, the United States, uh, a, a lot of the money is flowing into the private sector and not passing through and staying within the public sector. Well, this is a little bit, um, Unpleasant news um, in the in the last um, uh, decade or so, our life expectancy has been declining, unlike in other countries. Um, as we'll see, uh, maybe a piece of good news is um, our the rise in our expenditures, our costs has has sort of has leveled off in, since 2010, which is an interesting phenomenon. And I'm not sure I under, know and understand why. Um, you know, a lot of it may be due to um, increasingly uh, intense criticisms of how we do health healthcare, and maybe there's some systemic uh, attempts to improve the situation. But the the uh, so. Uh, uh, currently, about 20% of the, the GDP is um, we spend, uh, that's a huge portion of our GDP, over four, around $4 trillion. Um, I think about $13,000 per capita uh, we spend on healthcare. And what do we get? So uh, we, we get terrible infant mortality rates. Now, you might think, well, that has a lot to do with public health and, and lifestyle. Um, but this is one of those areas where uh, timely quality uh, pre perinatal maternal uh, medical care can really dramatically reduce infant mortality rates. And we, we do uh, clearly don't do well there. Um, just a little current news, we, we're really doing badly on, in comparative terms in terms of, uh, of COVID deaths. Um, this is OECD data. Um, I, I think because we're a powerful force in the o OECD, it says we're um, close to the OECD average, and we're, we're. I don't think that looks like close to the OECD average. Um, we're not doing well in that regard. Now, so I, I'm back to this uh, study research on um, avoidable. Now, I just want to insert here that, that I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot of slides here. I, want, I probably have to race through, race through them and we can come back to them, uh, any individual one if, you, if, you, if you'd like. But I want to motivate with, by showing in comparative terms how disordered we are in order to justify and in order to motivate uh, thinking and research and, and understanding about 
how did we get here? Why are we like this? Okay, so back to avoidable deaths. Um, so this shows, so again, um, we're, we're working with a list. This is just a partial list of uh, medical conditions that can be treated successfully to avert death. And um, we, uh, so these are data points for 2009 and 2019. Um, we're, we don't look bad in either year. Um, and interestingly, uh, the, uh, there was improvement over that period, over that decade, uh, but the improvements in other countries outstripped our improvements. Okay, so that's a head scratcher. Um, and I certainly uh, don't know how to explain it. Uh, I'm not a, a health services researcher and there are clearly multiple reasons for a complex um, problem, many causes for a, a, a problem that which has many, many dimensions. But there, there, there you are. There it is. It's, it's not very flattering. Uh, okay, the, so you might say, well, again, we're back to public health, um, social conditions. Yes, I, I would agree. And, and lifestyle, uh, although lifestyle often arguments are sort of blaming the victim. Uh, so there are different ways of uh, hypothesizing, speculating about these causes. Now this, I had some fun, I used this for my uh, undergraduate teaching. Uh, so the US in terms of per capita expenditure way up at the top and in terms of performance and death rates, uh, avoidable death rates at the bottom. And, and uh, so that's a pretty striking. Now that uh, you have countries that um, in Scandinavia that uh, spend uh, spent a lot back then and, and did better in terms of avoidable deaths. Um, and so it's all over the place. Uh, maybe uh, Greece is a interesting case where relatively little was spent, uh, but uh, outcomes and results, as Codman would put it, are, are better. Well, okay, yeah, you'd have, I don't know about all these countries and I, I'm not, I wouldn't venture to try to explain but it certainly, um, it makes it clear that um, how much you spend uh, doesn't determine how well you're gonna do in healthcare. So one thought I, I've had um, is that one, one reason we might do, so first of all, probably our, the average physician uh, in America is, is very, very good in comparative international terms. Um, so what's going on here? And one of the things may be uh, we Americans delay care. And so I, I think delayed care as, as well as lack of access could be a big part of it along with public health and individual lifestyle uh, problems. But we, we, many Americans delay getting care. Um, we skip medications uh, much more often than other countries, okay? Um, and we'll see, interestingly, uh, we, we, even, we, we take about the same number of pills. Um, well, well, I'll get to that in, in a minute. So this is a very interesting work by Uwe Reinhardt, who was a, a healthcare economist when I was at Princeton. Um, I think that's what he looked like when I was there. I, I thought he looked older back then, and, and, but this is obviously, and I was there before we had desk computers. So um, he, he probably looked even younger. But anyway, he's one of the, the greats. Uh, he's passed away um, in terms of um, health services, health economic uh, research. And his research showed um, that it's the prices uh, that explain a large proportion of America's higher expenses. Okay. And um, to, to a large extent, that's true. Um, physicians earn a, a substantially more than comparable countries. Um, although we have relatively fewer of them, um, so it balances out somewhat. Uh, we, we spend a lot more per physician for uh, relatively few physicians. I don't have uh, some numbers on those, but um, we actually have fewer physicians than a lot of comparable countries. Do we take more pills? Well, you, you'd think that so from this, from this figure here. Um, 
in terms of spending per capita on drugs, um, but we don't. Uh, the big factor as Reinhardt and others have uh, pointed out, I think I, oh, there, I wanna look at this slide here first. Um, uh, look at, check out these drugs. These are prices relative to the American prices and we're way, we're other than uh, the United Arab Emirates, it looks like for one of these drugs, um, we're way above the rest in terms of the prices we pay. You, you, you're, you, we're, we're all familiar with the politics and controversy surrounding uh, drug pricing now. Uh, our prices increased, have increased rapidly in the last couple of years um, for um, reasons I don't know. I, I wonder if it has something to do with COVID Maybe someone has some ideas out there in the audience um, that uh, you know, fewer people seeing doctors, maybe fewer drugs are being um, uh, prescribed, maybe. I'm speculating here and that the drug companies are trying to make up for uh, lost revenue with higher prices. Uh, it's not just drugs, the price of surgeries and other procedures are substantially higher uh, with very a uh, few exceptions in New Zealand, for some reason, cataract surgery looks like it's more expensive. Angiograms in uh, New Zealand as well, uh, up at the American levels. But these these are radically different, dramatically different uh, prices, which um, su suggest or, or kind of corroborate what Uwe Reinhardt was arguing. And in his research, which has been, which has been replicated and subsequently, um, we, in terms of utilization, the United States is often below the OECD median. So again, price, prices, it's the price is stupid, as he, as he said. Um, so here's an indication of the United States here is in yellow. These are OECD and other uh, advanced um, economic democ capitalist democracies, and in yellow you'll see that we're we're um, uh, high up in terms of um, performance of these various things, very expensive things. Now, I'm, I'm putting this up by way of criticism of Reinhardt's research in that the the it would, they they've used very crude figures, crude categorizations of utilization, and not broken down uh, into very expensive high tech. Um, uh, uh, treatments and, and procedures and drugs uh, for that matter. So um, it's not quite clear to me uh, that it's, it's not utilization, not clear that it's just prices. I think there's truly a lot more going on. Uh, Professor Swinson, yes. sorry to interrupt. Um, I just got a comment. If you could drag the top of the Order for your slides, just drag that green bar up a little bit to the top to reveal a little bit more of the top of the slides. Perfect. I think that, that's, that's as perfect. far as it will go. That's, yeah, that's great. Thank you. See, I want to see what happened there. Yeah. So maybe you didn't see. So it's a little bit cut off at the top, but now it's fixed. Thank okay. You. I hope I didn't cut off other essential things. Uh, angioplasty, uh, uh, stents. We do a lot more of uh, a very expensive uh, procedure. Uh, so the, the the health economists' research in this regard so, um, is a little bit too crude in my in my view. So um, there are costs and there are costs, and some of their costs are associated with risks you take and the, and the consequences of of um, dangerous risky procedures. And and one of those, say, with coronary artery bypass grafts or are uh, uh, infections, sternal wound infections. And here you get a picture of what percentage of different kinds of uh, infections uh, are result from, from um, uh, bypass grafts and, and um, they're significant. Um, we're not worse than uh, other country, countries necessarily, but because we do a lot more, we do more of them, uh, we're, we're incurring uh, costs that others don't. Um, and here uh, is a, a measure of uh, um, the estimated extra 
additional cost per procedure due to these infections, um, where uh, Japan looks worse than we do for some reason, uh, but we're, we're certainly not, we're, <laughs> we don't look good in this uh, regard. So uh, there are costs, uh, human as well as economic costs for a lot of the things we do in, in that well, we're, we're um, taking risks uh, with expensive things. Uh, one of the uh, major criticisms of what we do in the United States is the uh, uh, spinal fusion surgeries, and we're uh, way up there um, in, in numbers of relative to the average for uh, comparable uh, uh, countries, and a, a lot of criticism from within the profession. And I should say in that, on that note that most of my research, most of what I'm presenting here, uh, in order to motivate looking at, well, and asking the question, why, 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 how did we get here? And what, what happened is, is that I'm getting most of this from the medical profession itself. There are um, enormous numbers of critics in the medical profession who produce this kind of uh, research uh, that I've been using. So um, there's a, what I think is a significant element in the medical profession uh, and, and, and the healthcare professions in um, as other healthcare professions saying we this we're not doing good enough and here's why here's what we're doing that doesn't look look good uh, so uh, the spinal fusion procedures they've risen in price quadruple in price um, I don't know if these are constant dollars uh, I forget uh, but the amount were were um, uh, spending has, because of the numbers, increasing numbers, increasing utilization, uh, we're spending a huge amount for what many critics of the orthopedic surgery profession think is unnecessary, useless, wasteful, and uh, risky. So again, is it just the prices or is it utilization? And I think it is utilization because of uh, a lot of what we do that which is different from what other countries do and 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 especially in high tech high cost um and sometimes high risk uh, medicine so um, medical health services researchers have talked about the medical arms race uh, it's a race within the country not so much between the united states and other uh countries but within the country of, of hospital systems healthcare systems um, racing each other to um, invest in and, and amortize highly costly uh, invest, investments. One of the most striking instances of this is the protein beam accelerators uh, for treatment of various cancers. And, and I like Amitabh Chandra, health economist at Harvard, who said it's a metaphor for all the problems we have in American uh, medicine. We're spending a lot of money for things that uh, the evidence are not is not yet good for spending a lot of money on, and, and that in, in terms of um, uh, proton beam accelerators, we're way way out ahead of other countries. Um, there are ninety centers worldwide, thirty four of them in the United States, and relatively few in other wealthy uh, per population. Certainly, um, absolutely, and then per pop population in other. Uh, advanced countries, economically advanced countries. And a lot of, so their evidence is pretty good. Uh, it seems for uh, using a proton excel beams for some cancers, but the evidence is not very good for its superiority in the term for prostate cancer. And, and this is where uh, a large amount of its use is, uh, it's being yeah, used for, um, just not a lot of evidence that it's superior to cheaper um, uh, uh, methods. Maybe it's less risky, I don't, I don't know. Um, uh, I think there are risks um, that are uh, comp maybe comparable to other radiation. Maybe someone in the audience can help me out there. Uh, well, um, we spend a lot more on opioids uh, and that's costly in terms of money too, but costly in other terms uh, and, and, and in other terms that uh, ultimately boil down to uh, cost, economic costs, as well as human uh, costs for um, the rest of uh, society. Okay, why is that? 
this shows uh, availability of analgesic opioids, the United States over on way over on the right, uh, and a big bump up ahead of the next countries, Germany and Austria and Canada. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm seeing, uh, I, I may be using more time than I uh, should. I'm, I'm supposed to talk for 45 minutes. Um, um, Lauren, maybe you can tell me You've how got much time. I've got about uh, six, seven minutes. Oh boy, then I don't have time. I've got a lot <laughs> more. Okay, so okay. Uh, we, we, use, we use a lot of antibiotics. Not, we're not terrible. Um, uh, and that's responsible for uh, antimicrobial resistant microorganisms, uh, the development of uh, resistant uh, microorganisms is rising. Uh, we're high in terms of predicted deaths due to resistance. Uh, okay, so there's drug industry, uh, most profitable industry. And an important point is that every dollar waste is part of someone's income stream. Okay, so if, if, if eliminating waste, excess, uh, it's not gonna be easy because uh, if it's someone's part of someone's income stream, they're gonna be part of the resistance to change. So there's controversy over uh, what uh, we're, we're spending on drugs and how much of that is actually going to marketing versus um, research and development of new drugs. One area where we're, um, we're not doing well is development of new antibiotics approved by the FDA and, and the big pharma co companies are not putting a lot of money into developing new antibiotics that are being used up. So um, I have a lot of slides here from the research by the Commonwealth Fund um, about, and, and I invite you, recommend you look at this work research um, they, it's quite systematic. If you look over there on the right, our overall ranking of these countries is, is we're the worst in terms of different dimensions of healthcare system performance. Um, there we are way over on the right on the bottom in terms of performance and um, but high spending, um, care process, affordability, uh, administrative efficiency, and here, this is really important. If you look since the 1980s, uh, the number of physicians has risen re relatively slowly, but the number of administrators and the whole administrative apparatus for the American healthcare system is just ballooned. It's just skyrocketed. Um, here's a comparison of Canada and the United States. I don't have time. Canada and Germany, They're actually using less inputs. This is from Reinhardt's research, uh, but it's but uh, um, um, we're using less inputs, but we're paying higher prices, uh, a lot more administrative overhead, uh, equity, problems of access, uh, problems of, um, uh, of uh, bankruptcies, medical debt and bankruptcies. Uh, I'm having to race through because I, I, I wanna talk about the politics of of uh, medicine, bankruptcy statistics. It's pretty much uh, very few bankruptcies in other countries due to uh, medical debt, and and but, but it's very high in the United States. Healthcare outcomes. Well, we looked at that. Um, who else thinks there's a pervasive disorder? Well, primary physicians in America don't like what they see. Um, a lot of elite. Um, uh, physicians, and these are former, all former editors in the New England Journal of Medicine who published books critical of, of the American healthcare system and conflicts of interest. Uh, uh, Marsha Angel saying um, it's reached so far into uh, healthcare me medical research and uh, that you're not, she, you can't trust uh, clinical research because a lot of it's bought and paid for, the outcomes are bought and paid for. Warren Buffett says medical costs are a tapeworm of American economic competitiveness. Uh, major employers, big business leaders think uh, what, what we have is unsustainable. And the Institute of Medicine, uh, we have a pervasive public health neglect and, and disagree. 
Um, so let me switch over to another uh, set of slides here. Um, if I stop share and While right. you're doing that, I will answer just one question that's come up a few times, which sure. is, will this presentation be available on online? And it will, it will be on the Yale Alumni Academy website. If you go on our website and you click Academy Programs, you see our upcoming webinars and you also see our um, previous webinars and they are available on demand. Usually if there's a book, we also will um, put a link to purchase the book on the web page right alongside with the presentation. So that will be uh, on the page as well so that you can get more information on Professor Swenson's book and how you can get a copy from the Yale Bookstore. So if you go to a slideshow from the beginning. Okay, so I'm... Um... You want to go up to um, from the beginning? No, I'm, okay, uh, there you go. What are you seeing now? Uh, just a portion of the slide. So you want to bra drag the borders again on your green box. Oh, I see. I need to do that for for this. For, we didn't do that for the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Perfect. Oh, all right. I'm apologies for fumbling around with this system um, now. OK, so uh, sadly, I, I have so little time for so much more to, more to do. Um, so to give you a taste of what's in my book, uh, less, a lot less on um, the disorder itself and why it's a particularly American medical disorder. Um, but why, why is it? Uh, why are we different? And it's 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 about politics, the uh, big and the exceptional nature of uh, medical politics, and the per, per, peculiarly conservative and initially reactionary role of the American Medical Association and medical organizations generally. Um, so, in my book, I look at the um, conservative medical era, which started with a reactionary turn in the 1920s uh, from its earlier progressive, progressivism um, to, well, I, I wanted to mention that um, things have changed since the 1990s. The AMA actually came out in support of the Affordable Care Act. Um, so uh, before the 1920s, we, it was a period of um, great medical progressivism in the organized medicine, the American Medical so Association. And I define progressivism as promotion of disease prevention, even if it's not remunerative, um, equal distribution, and the search for simultaneously advancing quality. Um, this is a picture of pre-24, uh, president of the American Medical Association, Victor Vaughn, a pioneering bacteriologist, public health leader, dean of Michigan School of Medicine, uh, and, and very much a progressive, he even talked about um, preventive medicine as a in, in positive terms as a, as a, a socialistic movement, um, not in a Marxist sense, but a socialistic movement. Um, by 1924, the AMA was a different animal. And this was William Pusey, a dermatologist, um, a, a social Darwinism, uh, thought government, all government's bad, it break down indivi breaks down individualism and uh, counteracts nature's cruel but salutary process of eliminating the unfit. Um, you have to hear it, see it, to believe it, how extreme the, um, this was one of the dissidents in the 1920s against the progressive um, AMA. Uh, he was an obstetrician. Uh, he called a movement for birth control a feministic, uh, hysterical uh, movement, the assaulting civilization. Okay, I, you can't, um, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I... I may move that down. Okay. Um, and so moderate conservative uh, Dwight Eisenhower called the American Medical System just plain stupid. Okay. Um, that's how extreme the AMA was into the 50s. Now this is a little, uh, I can talk about it a bit. Um, why is it, what happened? Why, why did the AMA become so 
a crazy reactionary conservative into the into the late into the um, 20th century, um, and we can uh, talk about that. So uh, the AMA blocked guaranteed health care over decades and decades, very successfully uh, mobilizing its political might against health uh, health care. Um, a lot of it was the, what I call the outward exercise of power in, in my book is lobbying and campaign finance. Okay, so here's our um, um, uh, Yale neurosurgeon um, advised, he was called upon by the AMA to advise Frank, Franklin Roosevelt administration uh, to say uh, no health insurance. Um, Roosevelt decided to leave health insurance out of the Social Security Act out of fear that the American medicine so Medical Association was so powerful that they would drag down the whole um, the whole um, package of legislation. So we ended up without national health insurance in the 30s. Um, lobbying, the American Medical Association is among the fourth top trade. I mean, this I don't have older figures, but uh, top trade uh, association and corporate lobbyists, uh, uh, top four or five over. Um, uh, Couple of, couple of decades. It's a phenomenal force in American politics. Um, health professionals generally, uh, that includes a lot of what the organized medicine is, is not just the MA, but specialty societies or uh, many over, well over 100 medical specialty societies are involved in political lobbying for their interests. Um, I'll jump right over there. There's the American Political Action Committee. Um, uh, supporting very right-wing uh, 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 politicians. Um, we can talk about that more. Um, the aggressive propagation of ideology. The AMA played a big role in propagation of ideology, not just about the government and healthcare, but also other socio-political realms, including, um, well, all right, well, so here's back to COSMAC, um, the kind of ideology, uh, social Darwinist ideology, reactionary ideology that came out of the New York State um, Medical Society. Um, we looked at that. This was a, some pamphlets produced um, by a, a committee called the National Physicians Committee. And this is the kind of um, what what historian uh, uh, historians have called the paranoid style in American politics is a use of um, very extreme uh, rhetoric to scare people away from things. Um, health insurance was a part of a deeper plan evolved by a few seekers after power who, under the guise of social betterment, would change our democracy through centralization of power and bureaucracy. Into, this is what health insurance would do, um, according to the American Medical Association. Um, the AMA enlisted Ronald Reagan, who is an actor, not yet governor, not yet president, uh, in a fame who produced a, a, a vinyl recording um, that was used by the Women's Auxiliary of the AMA uh, to rouse up other doctors' wives to write to Congress and say things like, uh, very uh, apocalyptic things about what would happen if Medicare uh, were passed. One of these days, you and I are going to spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once was like in America when men were free if um, Medicare were passed and then other federal programs would invade every other area of freedom. The same line uh, Sarah Palin used in the last line of her uh, 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 vice presidential debate with Joe Biden. Um, so alliances with political forces, um, the pharmaceutical industry in particular, but also you'll find in my book with the cigarette industry and tobacco growing states politicians. And, and uh, uh, that's a uh, disturbing history. Um, it turned out that the National Physicians Committee spent millions of dollars. Um, it was instigated by um, Morris Fishbein of the AMA and uh, uh, Hoffman La Roche, uh, but 90% of this propaganda was funded by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, okay, um, I'm I'm gonna uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether I should um, uh, stop now. The AMA aligned with the pharmaceutical industry to stop the to try to block legislation to require the FDA to 
um, require um, studies of efficacy as well as safety before uh, marketing drugs. And, and the AMA argued along with the pharmaceutical industry that individual physicians have the knowledge, ability and responsibility to make those decisions on their own. They can see what, what, um, what their drugs they prescribe are doing and they don't need government to tell them what works and what doesn't work and what they should be allowed to use and, and sell. Um, uh, so I've got lots here on, on the, the kind of coalition, the alliance of the pharmaceutical industry and uh, pervasive conflicts of interest between uh, uh, the pharmaceutical industry and, and um, the medical profession uh, uh, writ large, not uh, medical academia, uh, uh, medical journalism, um, medical associations, and um, throughout the system. Okay, just a few words on the inward exercise of power. A lot of the power of the MA, and this is where I differed with Paul, with Paul Starr about where's the power of the organized medicine come from? And a lot of it was about inward, what I call the inward exercise of power is the silence of a considerable internal uh, dissent and, and disagreement with the conservatism of the, of the Prussian. Um, and and uh, a lot of people have been silenced over in, in medical history who were critics, um, among them Codman, who came up before. Uh, I'd love to talk more about John Peters. Um, he was a, a Yale's Eli professor of medicine, a pioneering medical scientist. Um, he organized a committee of elite physicians to try to um, insert debate and uh, inside the AMA to, to say, well, let's look at our, our, at our fa considerable flaws in terms of quality as well as uh, distribution of, of healthcare. Um, he was ultimately fired. He was um, smeared by the AMA and a, and a, um, a, a secret in FBI informer uh, for communist sympathies, which was nonsense uh, to say the least. Um, he, his decision was overturned, but his stress, according to his family, was so great that he um, he died of a massive heart attack, unable to complete his um, what he really wanted to do was re revise his major book on clinical chemistry. The silencing of George Cryle, who criticized fellow surgeons for radical mastectomies and um, made himself unelectable in organized medicine. Uh, Cleveland Medical Academy pronounced Cryle's actions when he took the information public, criticizing the fellow surgeons as reprehensible. Um, okay. Uh, uh, other people you, some of, a lot of you are familiar with, John Winberg, uh, early on in his, his um, career was silenced, um, but he emerged victorious and uh, as a major reform figure in American medicine. Uh, the editor of Journal of American Medical Association, fired by the AMA for his independence, um, editorial independence and some of the stuff he published in the uh, JAMA, um, uh, calling for, and other things, uh, the, uh, editorial, great en editorial independence. Jerome Kassira, the eminent former ed editor of the journal, New England Journal of Medicine, was also fired the same year, um, shortly after Lund Lundberg was fired. He was fired by the Massachusetts Medical Association for various indiscretions involving criticized criticism of uh, how American medicine is uh, produced. And finally, hostility uh, uh, to the AMA's organized medicine's hostility to public health and the public health system and um, the giving authority and, and uh, resources to the public health system, leaving behind a badly equipped, underfunded, di disorganized, um, fractured uh, public health system. Um, okay, so and that's the that's the, but the I'll leave I'll leave it at that. The Institute of Medicine, which is um, uh, that that's the opinion of of the Institute of Medicine that the political problems of public health lay in the uneasy relationship over decades and decades between organized medicine and public um, uh, uh, health institutions, uh, marked by confrontation and, and suspicion. Okay, apologies for. Uh, having too much, I have lots of more. I think you would find interesting, but uh, we should stop here. And I'd love to hear hear your uh, questions and maybe come back to some of my slides. Okay, great. Um, we have a lot of questions. 
uh, I, I want to start with Lawrence's, <laughs> Lawrence's question, because I think it addresses a, a really good point um, that you didn't quite touch on, which is the recent uh, dynamic between the FDA and um, sort of public criticism of the FDA in the context of COVID. Lauren, could I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm fumbling around here. Um, I'm only seeing you. Um, That's I, right. Is You're that right? right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And your slides are gone, so okay. yeah, that's right. Uh, so yeah, I just I wanted to go to Lawrence's question, just asking about your thoughts on the recent attacks on the FDA in the context of COVID nineteen. Um, whether uh, on the FDA, um, I don't know so much about the AMA criticized um, uh, Biden and his CDC. Uh, for for their guidelines, I, I'm not sure, um, and, and I thought that was strangely unfair because um, the the AMA was said very they really poked Biden in the eye in the CDC. I mean, for the relaxed guidelines and saying a lot, they said a lot of people would die, um, and and um, they didn't poke Ray uh, Donald Trump in the eye at all for um, the things he said about hydroxychloroquine, bleach, um, his dismissal, scornful dismissal of wearing masks and social dis distancing, um, they really tiptoed around uh, uh, Trump. So I think I may, maybe I would need more specifics on the criticism, criticism of, of, of the FDA about, um, you know, I, I'm on the side of, um, of caution and care and be before approving drugs. Um, and I think a lot of people are, you know, champing in the bit saying we should approve more, try out more. And I think that's a, 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 a mistake. Um, so that's the best I could do on, on that issue, I think. That's great. I, I, I want to shift a little bit to something that a few people have raised, which is the role of uh, private equity. So uh, Barry asks if you could comment on the increasing intrusion of private equity into virtually all areas of medical care in America. And John notes that many emergency medicine practices and anesthesiology practices are being acquired by private equity capital companies. How will these things impact uh, healthcare? Well, this is a huge phenomenon. I'm not no expert on it. Um, I, it um, it's very worrisome. It's the increasing penetration of, you know, I'm, I'm a capitalist in terms of we, we want markets and capitalism to do the things that it does well, which is when it works well, increase quality, reduce prices, and therefore increases value. There, there doesn't seem to be evidence that value is value only in the sense of profits is being created and value in terms of medical outcomes. Well, I think Ern um, Codman would be uh, and others would say, no, you, let's look at the outcomes before we make uh, we decide before we make other decisions. And Codman said he was one of the early op opponents to health insurance, national, government health insurance, but for good reasons. He said the practice of medicine was so bad um, that it's too early. We have to fix medicine before we start spending a lot of money making it available to every, everybody. So the, the, from the standpoint of a political science or, or the study of medical politics, here's the, here's the thing. You're not hearing from organized medicine, including the AMA as well as uh, the specialist societies. You're not hearing criticism of the interpenetration of um, commerce and um, uh, profit making in healthcare. Uh, there's a, a deafening silence, and you know, I'm, and maybe I'm being somewhat unfair, but I would call it a deafening silence about uh, about what's going going on. Um, and if you look at the the substance, the issues that the organized medicine lobbies on and the kind of politicians um, they fund. Okay, so to be fair, the AMPAC funds liberal Democrats as well as 
uh, ultra right wing um, um, Republicans. Uh, but it, it, maybe that balances out, maybe that that um, neutralize, it's neutralized, but you don't see the MA and it's uh, the medical societies uh, really coming out and going to battle against um, the, the pervasive commercialization of, of, of medicine and in new and um, alarming proportions as, as the um, equity, um, private equity industry. I mean, what, what business do they have? Are, are they making profits because they're improving healthcare? Uh, no, I think they're making profits because they, they're trans, they're, they're, they're re channeling the flow of wealth uh, into um, um, private pockets and without regard to uh, improvement of care. That's my opinion. Okay, well, lots of uh, good questions coming in and uh, really great comments in the chat too for everyone benefit, you know, we can't get to all the questions. So I always think it's, it's wonderful to have a lively conversation going on in tandem in the chat. Um, I want to go to a, a topic that you touched on briefly. Uh, Katerina raised this question. Could you speak about the possible role of the pharmaceutical lobby? Uh, Katerina says, I believe this might be the biggest lobby in the US uh, in creating the disproportion between expenditure and quality of healthcare. Um. I, I would say uh, biggest, uh, you know, next to fossil fuels and and the uh, aerospace military industrial complex. It's up, it's neck and neck. Uh, the medical industrial complex, writ large, which includes organized medicine and, and the pharmaceutical industry, the American Hospital Association, the insurance industry. Uh, you put them together, uh, and and the medical device industry. Um, I would say add them up and you have the biggest, um, uh, the big, you know, we're talking about 20% of the US GDP. Um, that's reflected in, how, in the spend expenditure of money by vested interest to maintain the system as, as it is um, and, and to, to protect it against uh, challenges and reform. So I, I'm not sure I would say, I'm, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure I could specifically quantify um, whether the, pharmaceutical industry is is the biggest, um, but I, it certainly is way, way up there at the top. When we talk about the costs of healthcare, you know, you, you demonstrated through your statistics that you shared, um, you know, this idea that there's a high cost and that we don't necessarily get the return and outcomes uh, relative to that cost. And a, a few people will just raise the point of looking at other factors in the um, supply chain, if you will, that, that takes a person from a medical student to uh, a professional in, in medicine, looking at the cost of education, the cost of insurance, um, malpractice insurance and lawsuits, and some factors that are unique to the American system overall and how they may play into this final pinnacle of high cost uh, care that's not necessarily better care. So I wonder if you could speak to some of those other contributing factors. So I, um, I heard a list, so you, I, can you just repeat? So you, medical malpractice and liability system, what, what were the others? The cost of medical education. I see. Um, um, let me talk about malpractice. Um, this is a myth um, that that so malpractice system, liability system, and and uh, often um, is blamed uh, because of uh, for for our high cost because of defense, so-called defensive medicine, and and there's no doubt that there are a lot of medicine is um, practiced defensively. Um, it's not clear whether it. You know, it's probably higher than other countries, um, but if you were to, uh, um, some of it, defensive medicine is probably good medicine. Uh, not all of it is is bad. Um, but here, one study found that only probably about two point four percent of our total healthcare expenditures can be 
blamed for um, on the medical malpractice system um, and and um, defensive medicine. And that's, you know, so I, I actually had to, some slides and, and I show, showed that um, if you look at the, 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 the slope of rising healthcare costs and you, and you made a kink in it at some point, say 1990, where you reduced by 2.4%, um, the, 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 the slope would be the same. Um, it, it would be slightly lower than it is in, in relative to other countries, maybe, um, but it's not the cost driver. It's not, it, it's, it's not, it, it's, and, and finally, I, I'm against major, I mean, I think it's a bad system in many, many ways. I, I teach about it, um, but there's so much medical malpractice and errors in medicine. Um, the, the, the figures are mind boggling according to the experts. And, and like one of the top three or so causes of death in America is malpractice or medical error. A lot of that's mal, malpractice. And most of people who suffer from malpractice don't get any compensation or any, any uh, they're not made whole in, in, in any way. And <laughs> lawyers need to take on these cases. And if you cut punitive damages uh, for medical malpractice, lawyers are not gonna take your case. They will then, and they're not gonna take your case unless it's a big, you know, it's a big case. And, and um, uh, so we're really not, we're kind of unprotected. And the malpractice system is one very flawed um, system for protecting us from malpractice. And, and it, it, it's not a good idea to, to, to fix it without fixing malpractice itself, in my view. Um, medical education, uh, it costs a lot more. Um, pay, uh, physicians have to pay a lot more than in other countries. I don't think it's a big part of the, it's a driver. I don't think it's the driver and explainer for um, what the overall thing. Maybe if we had public, uh, sub, public sub, you know, public picked up the tab for medical education, um, may, maybe doctors would demand less income, maybe. Uh, maybe they would get less income. Uh, I, I somehow doubt it. The organized medicine is so powerful in, in protecting the economic interests of uh, physicians, for good and bad, I, I hasten to say. Um, but uh, I, 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 I don't think these common sort of uh, arguments bandied around for, for why America is so disordered medically um, uh, really, um, really explain things. I think it's about political power and, and who, who benefits, every, as, I, as I say, every, way, every dollar of waste um, in American healthcare is, a, is part of the income stream into someone's pocket. And if you, if, you, uh, if you take measures to reduce that waste, you're stepping on toes. You're stepping on very, very powerful toes. So very organized, very well-financed political forces. Okay, a, couple, a lot of really great questions coming in and great discussion happening in the chat. And uh, I know that there are a number of people who really want me to probe with you. Um, what are the improvements? Uh, what's the way to fix this? But before we go there, I do want to get to some of the other problems that people have, um, have pointed out. So I wanna spend just two or three more minutes on talking about some of the problems because there's some really interesting ones that people have raised and then switch over to talking about what some of the solutions are. Uh, so on your last point, um, Professor Swenson, I, I wanna go to Diane's comment and I'm gonna preface it by saying that those of us who have pets that we care deeply about and have had to take for veterinary care can also speak to the high cost of veterinary care and the fact that in, in some cases in the US, pets may get better medical care than, than poor people receive. And uh, I wanna just kind of pair that with uh, Diane's question, whether you asked uh, the data about race and, race and ethnicity and socioeconomic stat status, did you stratify it that way? Because the social inequities in the US affect access to care and those who don't have access either because they don't have insurance or transportation or affordability of 
drugs or education or language barriers or um, groups that historically mistrust medicine will have poor outcomes and that will affect the overall uh, statistics. Uh, good, good questions. Um, I, I think a lot of pets get a, a lot of um, good care, a lot of unnecessary care uh, in, in my view, um, uh, uh, but probably the pets of very wealthy people uh, and not, 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 not only. Um, I, have, I have a very good um, physician friend who um, thinks that a lot of veterinarians um, milk their patients uh, to do a lot of expensive stuff that's not good, that's unnecessary. Um, I, if, if if I may, uh, we had a, and and that's this is not an important question relative to to the um, health equity issue, um, and maybe I should should move on to that because that's really really a lot more important. Now, so my book is about politics of medicine, and and it's got a lot about racism um, and sexism in medicine. And that's a legacy of um, American medical conservatism. And I mean, we're talking about a lot of rich white male physicians, mostly specialists who dominated um, organized medicine, who still dominate organized medicine. And um, what, what remains is the vast health inequities, uh, and not just for race, but it's in income in, in general. And we're, we're, we're trying to clean up the mess. Uh, even the MA is making noises about we have to fix health equity. It wasn't until 2008 that the AMA apologized for um, its racist policies of the, of the 20th century. Um, it's, it, things are changing slowly. I didn't have slides on, you know, I, I, I didn't get through uh, you know uh, the slides that I have, um, and and um, I certainly could have. Uh, I, I think that just looking at the uh, inequalities in healthcare relative to inequalities of income uh, tells a lot of the story, but not the whole story, of course, because racism and and other structural features of American politics and society. Uh, uh, I add on to the to the injuries and and neglect. Um, so, um, but again, my my work is about politics and what. How did we get to where we are, um, which is so bad relative to other uh, other other countries? And if you if you think about opposition to health insurance, okay, so. I mean, look at the, the historical injuries with, ma with many decades of bad legacies. Um, the AMA aligned with Southern tobacco growing uh, Jim Crow states um, and politicians to block health care. They had an alliance uh, with tobacco as well as the drug industry to block universal health care. That's, that's why we are where we are now because of the legacy of, um, of it, racism uh, in the, uh, not all, um, obviously within, across the entire country, but within the American Medical Association itself. Um, I have a lot of interesting stuff about the, the history of racism in, in medicine. And um, so I, I neglected that in my talk, but it, it's there in my book. And I know you keep apologizing for the length of your slides, but I think it, you know that people may not realize because they haven't seen your book yet um, that you know the book is quite dense and it covers a lot. And so you, what you've tried to do is, is really give us a great survey of some of the kinds of topics that you touch on in the book, which you know you can't do in a ninety-minute session. You can't cover in depth a book like yours. So I, I really think people appreciate the opportunity to ask some questions and, and raise some issues and follow up with reading reading the book. Um, and yeah, so, so to, to repeat, I, 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 want, I knew I was spending too much time on, on the American medical disorder and why it's peculiarly American um, in order to motivate looking at the past and history to see um, 
you know, so they're formative events, formative injuries, uh, formative uh, creation of the structure of things, the structure of bad incentives and disincentives and, and constraints that that um, are responsible for the American medical disorder. There's less in my there's you know re relatively little book in my book in my, in my book that that actually lays out the dimensions of our disorder in the way that I did here, which I, I want I, I did in order to try to um, um, pique people's interest in the politics and history of of what of what we're what we experience now. That's great. Uh, a number of people just, you know, kind of touching on lots of different topics that I think they'll find more detail on in, in the book. One of these topics as we sort of shift into talking about solutions that I think is, uh, is really interesting is Denny's comment that technology and regulatory changes are forcing organized healthcare to make health data available to consumers. And this is one of the first steps in creating a more transparent health system and promoting alternative and disruptive approaches to health. Wondering if you could comment on that idea. Oh, yeah, I could have, a, I have a lot of comments about, um, you know, so transparency, we don't have it. Uh, E.A. Codman called for, measuring outcomes, reporting on outcomes to, to hold doctors, surgeons, hospitals accountable. And we don't have that transparency. Um, so uh, capitalists, the market works when there's abundant information. There's no, there's no market that where there's less information available to consumers than, it, than in medicine. And when I talk about mostly consumers, are not individual patients, but they're um, insurance companies, um, healthcare systems that are doing the consuming for us. And they're the ones who should be the discriminating customers, the discriminating buyers. And they not only have very bad information, not only about quality, but also about prices um, uh, to, to make rational decisions for us. And as patients, we're individual, we're just babes in the woods. Um, we spend more time researching the quality and of, of automobiles we buy or bicycles or microwave ovens than we do on doctors be, or hospitals because they're, it's easy, first of all, to get the pr price information, right? Where can you get price information about even drugs uh, that, that you're buying? Um, Walmart versus... Uh, um, CVS, um, it's very hard to shop, uh, even at even at that simple level, much less quality. How can you shop on the base of quality? There's no consumer reports that you can go uh, get information about individual doctors and hospitals and their um, performance, their outcomes, their end, end results. Well, we're getting there. I mean, that is part of the um, there's a reform element in the American medical profession that is pushing for transparency and outcomes measurement and for, for comparisons. But I, I think um, individual patients, uh, we're babes in the woods. Uh, we, need, we need a systems a system that's choosing for us. Um, it's too much to ask um, for us to, to expect, to think that patients, that individual consumers can shape um, healthcare by their market choices. They can't. That's a great point. And when you, when you kind of shift into individual responsibility, it gets to another question that's come up quite frequently in the topic of what do we do about this? How can we, how can we achieve better outcomes? Which is looking at individual um, patient responsibility in terms of preventative care and, uh, and uh, I think I lost, no, I do. I have Katerina's point, wondering if Americans are less healthy than other OECD populations because of personal care issues. Is our, is our, uh, is our culture of how we do self-care, of what we eat, of um, the kinds of preventative activities that we engage in, is that a part of our outcomes? Well, um... Uh, yes and 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 no. <laughs> uh, 
um, it, I, I, I think it's, um, you don't wanna blame the victim if there are structural systemic problems that are creating the wrong incentives, the wrong um, choices, the wrong constraints. Um, let's take, for example, uh, you know, so poverty. Poverty is the, the most dangerous thing from the standpoint of health. Um, take, for example, food deserts in, in inner cities. Uh, <laughs> Um, the, the cheapness of a calorie, cal the calories for, for in potato chips versus um, green peppers. Uh, you know, advertising, um, commercial, you know, the commercialization of the, the, the meat and food industry, highly monopolistic uh, industries that exercise massive cl political clout. Okay, I'm hesitant to um to, to 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 blame individuals when when their choices are structured uh you know that's a very paternalistic uh, may very liberal uh, position to take um, but i think you know to the extent we criticize the medical profession they're all also you know they're to blame um in in one in some sense i mean say the over prescribing of antibiotics I mean, the dangerous overprescribing of antibiotics. Well, a lot of patients whine and they want antibiotics um, and the doctors, they're in, a, they're in a rush. They don't wanna say no and they just write the prescription and to get the patient out. Well, that's part of a cons uh, incentive and constraint system where they're over, they're, um, they're being, they wanna maintain a target income. They have to treat so many patients per, per hour and per day. And, and um, uh, the population is not being informed about the dangers of antibiotics. And, and so we're, we're part, each individual is a, I'm just in a massive web and network of forces where it re, it's just really wrong, I think, in my view, to um, blame individual choices for a systemic problem. And I, I think it ties to some of the things that you said earlier as well uh, about the AMA and the role that they had in developing uh, the politics of this system. You know, the emphasis is on uh, on the profit side, and there's not a lot of profit in in prevention. So I think that you know can make a difference as well. Um, I, I want to give you in the in the few minutes that we have left an opportunity to talk about what you think the solutions are. You know, we've thrown out a few draw horses here and um, what what are your ideas of a perfect world scenario of fixing this disorder well <laughs> yikes give us a prescription please professor Swan. all right i'm gonna write you a prescription and we're you're out of here um okay a political prescription uh it's about power and money and a lot of the power resides in organized medicine. Um, I think historically the, the, um, it's at fault uh, for creating the system we, we have um, through the exercise of power. And it, it did that in the period after the 20s, which I analyze. Okay, so it's a political diagnosis and a political prescription um, and, and not about the specific, you know, what we should do with specific fixes. Like, okay, let's cut down the administrative costs by passing universal single payer healthcare uh, because uh, here's an interesting, uh, I, I can go off in different directions here. Um, but so let me go back to the um, my, my original angle was that um, a, a conservative reactionary element um, that I talk in, in a in a in the 1920s took over control of the AMA and turned it into what it became. Um, it could happen again. 
I, and and there there there's movement in that direction. There's a reform element, mostly mostly younger physicians, um, uh, to a large extent, uh, women, and and black physicians um, who are part of a progress, but also a lot of elite, um, you know, physicians who are critical who really need to re retake control of organized medicine. I'm not real optimistic about this. It's a little bit pie in the sky, but another insurgency and another takeover, uh, a progressive takeover of organized medicine. Uh, I, you know, a lot of people I've brought this up with think that's pie in the sky. Um, I, 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 I don't know. Um, so there are specific there are things like uh, reducing administrative bureaucratic waste. So we usually think of government as being wasteful and inefficient and bureaucratic. Well, that it ain't nothing compared to the waste and bureaucracy and administration in, in healthcare. I, you, I showed you that slide with a ballooning of administrative costs uh, and over decades and without um, that buying us anything in terms of quality and value. In, in healthcare. So how do you reduce administrative waste um, without, and you'll be stepping on the toes of, as I said, of uh, people who earn money off of waste and they are, they're a powerful force. So I, I guess by prescription, there, there are many, um, there, we, we could look at what uh, European countries are doing in terms of negotiating prices and controlling drug prices. Um, I, I, I had some interesting slides on, on that. There are things we, we could do and there's political movement in that direction. I don't see organized medicine uh, playing a role there, shouting out loud and, and using its lobbying muscle and campaign financing muscle to, to do that. <laughs> I, you probably hear the, the um, sort of frustration and indignation in my voice here. But um, so on that note, um, so the, the organized medicine isn't as bad in terms of reactionary conservative as it once was in, in my view, but you know, there's the expression, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Well, that's an often unfair because if you don't have any power, that's, that's not fair, but the organized medicine and uh, has power and it's not using it. Okay, maybe it's not making things worse now, but it's, um, it's part of the status quo. It's part of the vested interests in, um, maintaining things uh, as they are. And the first um, solution is to, and to create a coalition of reform that includes physicians, um, that organizes physicians in alliance with other reform elements in American society and politics. And, and um, uh, arguing about particular solutions is like arguing about slices of pies in the sky. Okay, um, who gets what? Which what should the slices be? How should they be cut? Um, that that's that's um, arguing over pies, pies in the sky, um, be, be without getting to the core problem, which is political will, political power. Well, with that, I think we should bring our conversation to an end. Uh, there's so many more directions that we could go in and I would encourage people to, um, I put a link in the chat to where they can get a copy of your book. Uh, and I also encourage you to share this presentation with others that you know, it will be live on the Alumni Academy website within a few days. And we will send out a link to the presentation um, to everyone who attended today and everyone who registered. I invite you to can join I, us. Can yeah, I, go ahead. I just want to plug one more thing. Yes, um, please. I, I'm, I have a piece coming out in Medscape um, in, any day now. Um, it's called House of Medicine for Rent, um, which has some of um, my, so, so, something very short. <laughs> I tend to be lengthy, but it's very short uh, about some of my thoughts about uh, organized medicine and, and its um, in, in its role. So look up a, a lot of you are probably readers of Medscape and, and you'll you'll find something uh, uh, that's not in my book um, in in there. Well, and if you share the link, uh, we'll we'll link to it from the page for this presentation, so people can find it really easily in one spot. So happy to put that up. And uh, I do invite everybody to please join us next week. On this theme, we are um, going to be with Megan O'Rourke and um, 
and the managing editor from The Atlantic. And Megan is the editor for the Yale Review. And she's going to be talking about her book, uh, The Invisible Kingdom, which is Reimagining Chronic Illness, New York Times bestselling book. So we're going to be talking about what this whole system looks like to you when you're struggling with a chronic illness that doesn't have a diagnosis. So continuing on this theme next week, um, you can register for uh, Megan's presentation on the Yale Alumni Academy website as well. Thank you so much for being with us today, Professor Swenson. Is there anything you'd like to say just as we close out? <laughs> um, pro <laughs> probably not without a lot of uh, words. So thank you, thank you for coming all. Um, and and I hope um, I hope if I, I hope I've piqued your interest into um, uh, the politics and history of of medicine as well as its problems and, and the kinds of specific solutions that we could achieve through politics again. Wonderful. Well, I hope we can have you back again. Uh, it, it's wonderful thank to have you. had you as a guest and thank all of you for participating. We'll see you at the next Yale Alumni Academy lecture. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.